Um, thank you all very much. Um, I'm really uh, pleased to be here. Um, I remember when I was approached uh, about this conference a few months ago, I think I was, took me about two minutes to say yes. So um, that shows you how, how happy I am. And I'm also glad that I managed to make it to be here in town um, <laughs> for this. Uh, we have crazy travel schedules. And in particular, it's been um, interesting because we've been traveling around disseminating this report that uh, David mentioned that we've just completed called More and Better Jobs in South Asia. I'll talk a little bit about that report today. Um, anyway, let me get quickly into the points that I wanted to make. Um, South Asia is undergoing a very major demographic transition. And what I mean by that is South Asia is the ratio of young people in South Asia to, to old age and, and very young uh, children is, is really going to be the highest in the world. The region will contribute 40% of the uh, new entrants to the, to the world's uh, working age population over the never, next several decades until about 2050. And in fact, of all regions in the world, it's going to be contributing the largest number of working age populations. So it's, it's, it's um, uh, a pretty important change that's going on in the region at the moment. And South Asia, therefore, has the opportunity to reap a large demographic dividend. What do I mean by that? Normally, when you have the, 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 the ratio that are showing here, the ratio of non-working age population to working age population is called the dependency ratio. That's just a technical thing. But what it means is that the, the resources that you would normally spend supporting dependents, elderly and, and young children, in South Asia can be used productively to create, to, to invest and to create jobs for this large uh, growing uh, working age population. So there is a potential for harnessing resources that would otherwise have been spent uh, taking care of dependents. And uh, it all depends on what governments do and what you all um, uh, will, through your uh, influences, make, uh, ask for your governments to do. Uh, the good news so far, as uh, David mentioned, is that South Asia has had a, de a good record of creating jobs so far. Uh, something like uh, 850,000, 800,000 jobs have been created on average over the last two, uh, per month, by the way, uh, um, on average for the last um, two decades. Uh, and employment growth has more or less tracked growth in, in, the, in the labor force. Uh, so open unemployment is low. We can talk about the quality of the employment. We can talk about whether the open unemployment me, uh, disguises you know, things like underemployment. But the fact of the matter is employment growth has grown. And the other, uh, the other fact to point out is that these jobs have been mostly better jobs. And I want to be very, very clear what I mean by better jobs and not getting into arguments with my colleagues in the ILO about what we mean by better jobs. In our context, in the context of this report, we define better jobs as jobs that resulted in higher real income, so income adjusted for inflation, or in, the case where we, in cases where we don't have wages because these are not regular wage jobs, we look for whether poverty rates have declined in those types of employment. And we find that by those definitions, either real wage growth or declines in poverty rates, um, jobs have actually been better in South Asia, by and large. But, and this is where I think the coming challenges need to be discussed, South Asia is a region with the highest gender inequality in the world. The gender inequality index is a, it uses five indicators ranging from, you know, it basically reflect achievements and differences in achievement between men and women. It includes things like maternal mortality, adolescence, uh, fertility and parliamentary representation and so on. Well, South Asia ranks, um, um, you know, very poorly. It's got the highest uh, gender inequality, higher than um, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and, and MENAF, which are regions you normally think might have that, but actually the facts are that South Asia uh, does have the highest gender inequality. This is something we need to watch for. Malnutrition. Uh, both Hassan and Caroline talked about early childhood development is unacceptably high. It's something that's starting to come into people's um, consciousness now. I think The Economist this past week had a story about malnutrition, actually, and mentioned India and Egypt and a couple of other countries. Um, this, this um, you know, it, it, 
I really want to emphasize how important this is. This is in, in the first 1,000 days of a child's life, that's from conception to about age two, is when most of the brain development takes place. And if the child is undernourished, you really have very serious, cons irreversible consequences for brain development, which then have consequences on cognitive abilities, abilities to learn, abilities to be productive, and abilities to earn. So it really does have very profound consequences uh, for the lifetime of the, of the uh, individual. Literacy rates, very low, particularly for women. Um, South Asia youth literacy rates are, uh, you know, for females are 73%, only low, only slightly higher than in Sub-Saharan Africa and much lower than in most of the rest of the world. Um, it has low youth labor force participation, especially by women. And there are a number of reasons that, you know, for why this might be going on, including those covered by the gender WDR, which came out last year, uh, having to do with societal pressures on women, uh, uh, difficulties in freeing up women's time to participate in the labor force, et cetera. But the fact remains that South Asia has very low youth labor force participation, both for men, but especially for, uh, for women. And it's much lower than the rest of the world. You can take a closer look at these numbers uh, at your leisure. But let me finally just get to use my next last two minutes to say something about what I think needs to be done. Um, as I said, South Asia has grown rapidly. It's only the second most rapidly growing region after East Asia over the last 20 years. Uh, poverty has declined. But, and, and jobs have been created, and I said mostly better jobs. Um, but youth in South Asia face many challenges during their transition to adulthood, including malnutrition, gender inequality, and lack of access to quality education. Now, the coming demographic transition can yield a dividend. Uh, or become a curse, depending on whether governments adopt policies aimed at creating an environment for productive jobs. And what I'm trying to emphasize here is we need a multi-sectoral approach. It's not just about education or about nutrition or about health. It really is about focusing on relieving very deep infrastructure constraints. When we asked firms, we surveyed firms in South Asia, we asked them, what is your number one constraint? Everyone, no matter which country, no matter what size, no matter what the location, urban, rural, electricity. And those of you who are from South Asia and have been there or have visited there know what I'm talking about. Um, these are significant shortages. They have been building for a while. And we need to start putting very strong pressure on, the, on our governments to be concerted in, in, in building up very rapidly um, infrastructure, including electricity, but also other, other types of infrastructure. Dealing with early childhood development, I just talked about it. It is becoming more recognized. It's, it's coming higher on people's radar screens. But I think more pressure needs to be brought to bear uh, on this. Raising job-related skills, especially for females. Um, broadening the revenue base. These are countries that have very low revenue collection as a share of GDP, lowest in the world. And you know, in the face of such large social needs, I think there is a need for governments to make an effort to collect, collect more revenue in a, in a, non, you, in a mostly non-distortionary way. Tackling corruption, this comes up as a big, big uh, constraint for firms as well. Um, and encouraging regional cooperation and trade for job creation. This, South Asia is a region that has the lowest, uh, by far, regional trade. Uh, these are countries that have historically had poor relations. Um, wars and, and so on and so forth. But I think it's time to break down those barriers and start using regional trade, unexploited opportunities in regional trade for job creation. And um, the good news, let me end with good news. I think all the countries in South Asia have democratically elected governments now. Uh, and all the progress of the last decade has raised the aspirations of youth in these countries. Uh, those of you who have visited there recently will see that. You'll see that in the social media. You'll see that in the, in the regular conventional media. You'll see it on the streets, uh, in restaurants, in universities, everywhere. Governments have to respond to these aspirations. And I think that, uh, fortunately, gro strong growth is helping them do this. Now, there are some things I think you all uh, need to do in addition to pushing um, you know, through your, um, uh, whatever the avenues that you work through on the points that I just made. But I think there's also a responsibility that youth have. And that is to, while, while demanding from your governments <clears throat> the points that I raised here and any other that you think is relevant, 
to also play your own role. I mean, last, last week I was in Sri Lanka disseminating this jobs report, and we had a conversation <clears throat> with some young people, and I was shocked and slightly disappointed, well, quite disappointed to hear a young person in the audience saying, when we asked, you know, what do you think of as a, as a good or a better job? And he said, well, I want to join the government. I said, okay, why is that? He said, well, the work is very easy, which basically means it's really easy and you don't work hard or nobody cares about whether you're productive or not. And the pension is good. This is a 17-year-old who's worried about his pension. Anyway, I, I, I trust that no one in this room thinks that way, and, and so that's why uh, saying this to you, maybe preaching to the choir, but I think there is a legitimate role that you all will play, need to play to push governments to do what is necessary to grow jobs and to give you the skills that you need and the access that you need, but you also have a big responsibility in, in taking, the, uh, taking the opportunities that are available to you and pushing forward. Thank you very much.